Thank you for joining the November 8th, 2018 Volta call. We have two, di two discussion topics lined up today. One is a demo for Ponsim V2, and then time permitting also uh, some discussion on Infinity Router. And then we have the proposed design for Vol 1023, which is to support multiple unis per ONU. And do keep in mind we post these recordings to YouTube, so remember that during the presentations and during the discussion as well. And with that, I do show about two minutes off uh, after the hour, so I'll go ahead, Ken, and give you presentation right. Okay. A minute here. Okay, you should have presentation capability now. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to leave, uh, make it a little bit bigger here. Okay, so this, uh, what I'm going to present, I'm just going to go to the next slide quickly. So basically, I'm just going to have a, a brief uh, recall of uh, of the Volta core and adapter interaction. Just one slide of that. I'm going to do. I'm going to do the demo after, uh, followed by the a code walkthrough. The, the aim of that code walkthrough is really to highlight areas that um, adapter developers will need to to pay specific attentions when developing their adapters. So let's uh, go quickly to uh, the core adapter interface as we discussed a while back. Uh, as we know, like uh, all the adapters now will need to be in container for, for Volta 2.0, container error, and they will need to talk to the core via the Kafka messaging bus. So in this, in this diagram, the Kafka messaging bus is, is in yellow, and uh, you can see like in the core, there's a, there's a bunch of, uh, classes, different classes there. Uh, pretty much uh, the call, uh, in order to talk to an adapter, talk to the adapter proxy, which send it to the Kafka messaging proxy, and then that goes to the uh, messaging bus, and the reverse happen uh, onto the ad adapter. So the adapter to receive requests from the call needs to implement the adapter request for SAID. And I'm going to go over that uh, during the code walkthrough. And every time the adapter needs to talk to the core, they need to go through the core proxy. And uh, you make a request to the core proxy and that the reverse happen into the core where the core implement the core request uh, handle. So this is, this is really the, the overview of the interaction between the core and the adapters. In terms of the demo, this is the setup of the demo. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to do it all local on my, uh, on my Mac. Uh, I'm going to use the CLI. Uh, actually, the CLI, uh, it's nicer looking from my ID, so I'm going to run it from my ID directly instead of uh, or from the container. It's going to talk to the read-write core. Uh, this is all in Golang. Uh, I'll have the Kafka adapter and cluster messaging, messaging bus together, like uh, Recall that before we were talking about having a separate Kafka adapter bus, one for messaging between the core and the adapters, and a separate cluster messaging bus. This is to talk to the external world. So for this demo, I'm just putting both of them together. It doesn't, doesn't matter. And uh, what are we? What also we have? We have the Ponsim OLT adapter, which is containerized. Uh, Ponsim OLT adapter containerized, and also those the OLT would be talking to the Ponsim V2 OLT, which talk to the Ponsim V2 ONU. So this is, uh, this is the setup of that demo. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so let's, uh, let me start uh, the demo. So you can see my screen, right? Yes. Make it big. Okay, good. So I'm going to start a bunch of uh, uh, containers, and I'm going to have my cheat sheet here. So 
we can see at this time there's no no containers running so I'm, what i'm going to do i'm going to start first uh, kafka and uh, this will start both kafka and zookeeper so up and running and then i'm going to start uh, etcd for this uh, demo i'm doing everything in memory so i'm not really using etcd and uh, to store any data but uh, i still need it to run because some code needs to run so. and i'm going to start the the volta core and if you see the volta core i'm going to show the log of the volta core here you can see it's up and running that's what it started it's up and running and at the same time, I'm going to start the OLT, uh, the Ponsim V2 OLT, and the Ponsim V2 ONU. Doesn't matter in which one they, they get started. And also, I'm starting the the adapters. So this this one will start uh, this command is start both the Ponsim OLT adapter and ONU adapter. If you look on the logs on the right side, here the moment I started the adapters, you have received those two messages. A register message coming in. I know one is saying uh, it's a Ponsim ONU adapter and one is the Ponsim OLT adapter, and you have a bunch of uh, data that is sending. Uh, for registration. So now the two of them are talking. Basically what happened, they have uh, registered topics that both of them can uh, can listen to. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start the provisioning, but first of all, I'm going to start the, the logs uh, in each of the adapters. So. On this side is the OLT adapter logs. This is the one new adapter logs. And I'm going to start the CLI uh, from my ID. It's, it's, it's a nicer uh, from the ID, so I'm going to do that. So in order for me to, one more thing, uh, in order for me to provision the OLT, the Ponsim B2 OLT, I need to know its IP address. So if I look at here, this is the Ponsim OLT V2. Let me check its IP address. This IP address is 172.28.06. So this is what I'm going to use to, to provision, pre-provision that OLT. So I'll go back to that uh, ID here. I'm going to do a pre-provisioning command. And, and here I get a device ID. Uh, recall before uh, in Volta 1.x, uh, we always, the first uh, four hex was the core ID. Uh, we no longer use the core ID, so that's that's gone. So just a, a random ID here. Yeah. And here, once I do a pre-provisioning, uh, if you look at the log, you see a lot of bunch of things happening. Uh, ignore some of those errors in the core. Uh, those are more data model uh, spitting stuff just for tracing, <laughs> but it's not. Uh, it's not uh, so, so, so. Um, mm -hmm. Can I ask one quick, quick question? Uh, so, the oh. you said the 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 you don't we don't use core ID anymore because uh, so all the core is sharing the same digits, or you still you know. So right now you know, for the cluster, you have three cores, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, but in in the, in the new way of doing things, all the clusters, what they are going to do, they they are going to show. They you will have the cluster data, and yeah. each of those cores will be taking ownership of part of that data. We'll be looking at at part of that data, and and in fact, you will have two cores looking at the same set of data. This is for a chain. Okay. But, so so the de device ID doesn't matter which core. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, doesn't for example, if you're, it doesn't change. So if, if you have a core that goes down, 
and the request right. goes to another call, the other call will look at that ID and says, oh, I don't have that ID in, in, uh, in memory. Let me load it from the KV store to load that device in, in the KV store and proceed with that mm -hmm. request. Okay. And, and this, is, this is new in 2.0. Even 1.5 doesn't have this, right? Yeah. In, in, in 1.x, uh, uh, we needed to have the, the call ID. Call ID, yeah. yeah. So if, uh, if, for example, a call goes down, we were restarting another call, and that new call was taking all the ownership of all those other devices starting with that specific call ID. It, was, it got assigned. Everything that ever the previous call was doing, take that one. Now it's okay. the granularity, it's more at the device level. Okay. And, 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 mm -hmm. and is the is the core ID the, the first four uh, you know the, the I should I also say digits. That's the only changes or the, whatever behind it were also changed. I we have the MAC address, right? Uh, we have the MAC address of the device, right? Yeah, uh, we're using the MAC address for the logical device ID. Uh, okay. The device, okay. the device ID itself is just just an ID. We can we can okay. uh, we can like uh, according to to the spec, we can the first four we can it, it's proprietary. We can put whatever we want to uh, in that. If 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 we any other component, for example, above or nose or SIBA, whoever that needs to have something very specific in the four. Uh, first uh, hex, then we can we can make changes there. But uh, but as far as we're concerned, at, at this time it doesn't matter. Okay. 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 Thanks. So once, okay. So so here you well, there's a bunch of uh, you can see on the adapters, there's a bunch of heartbeat uh, happening. Basically, they're selling all those heartbeat on Kafka, just to say, hey, I'm alive. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to enable that. Uh, that OLT that has pre provision. Now, let me see. Okay, so here there's one bug that uh, happened from time to time. This is in the model. Uh, what I'm, I need to do, I need to restore the core for that. Uh, basically, what what happened is it come. It says it, it cannot find the data uh, for like. Okay. It's try to add a, a logical point. It says can't find the data. It's a, it's a bug that we're tracking, uh, but uh, it's a nasty bug that uh, I mentioned last uh, Thursday, last Tuesday in, in the call. That it's such a bug that we are we're tracking. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop uh, stop the call and restart the call. And usually we start the uh, clears. Uh... Let me try try this again. This command. Okay, now it's uh it's okay. So basically, what uh, during that uh, enable uh, message, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, action that has happened, and uh, basically that has that request has gone to the core. The core have taken that and and have created an adopt device on the OLT adapter. So it send that over Kafka. The OLT adapter adopt that device and also send back a bunch of ONU messages. Uh, or new devices that is detected, then the core take those uh, requests, uh, device uh, child device detected, and in and start to do adopt onto the using the own new adapters. So there's a there's a lot of things that has happened during that time. But one of the things also that happened, we also have created the logical device ID. Before in the each adapters will responsible for creating the logical device ID and the logical port. Now we, all these are created inside the core. So if we look, uh, just if we look at, uh, at the logical device, let's look at the devices first. So here we have the uh, 
Bouncing away to device and one new device. And they all enable, active, reachable. Those are simulated device. They are always in good state. If we look at the logical device here, we'll see that. Uh, uh, let me see. Let's. Uh, Let's see the ports on this one. You can see here we have two ports on that logical device. We have the NNI port and the UNI port. Uh, the NNI port uh, is, uh, before we were always having a, a digital, we we're saying like two, for example. Uh, I put uh, an NNI port dash two here. Uh, the reason I, I did that is uh, in the core currently, we can support at least the infrastructures in place to support multiple NNIs and multiple UNIs. Uh, to, the one place that uh, changes will still be need to be done uh, to have full support of that will be in flow decomposition. But uh, in, in terms of the device management itself, uh, we, if a device uh, want to reach the multiple NNIs or multiple UNIs, this, the core supports that at this time. Uh, one thing I want to show, once devices are, are registered, one thing that they do, they also send message, uh, metrics onto the Kafka bus. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show the, the metrics on the Kafka. You see you have metrics from Fonti uh, Moelti, Fonti Moenu. They just keep they just keep coming the, the metrics from the ONU and uh, the Ponsing B2 ONU the actual ONU device if we want to say that it's the ONU adapter the Ponsing ONU adapter that trigger that request that request gets proxied via uh, the Ponsing OLT adapter via the Kafka bus the adapter go and grab that data from the actual one new device, sends back uh, to the OLT adapter, and OLT adapter send this over the Kafka bus onto the ONU. And then the ONU publish ONU adapter and is publishing that data. So this is what you're what you're seeing all these metrics uh, happening there. And the other thing that I, I want to, to show, let me start the And Ken, um, yes. is, the, is the same message has been sending out periodically? And the, well, the main, I mean? into the Kafka bus, you know, so it seems like the, the message continues sending out. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, oh. because it's uh, the, for the metrics, uh, the way it works, uh, we send metrics every 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So once one a device is activated, uh, at this time, mm -hmm. we just, okay, so every 15 seconds, send metrics. We need metrics. And it's, uh, it's, it's controlled by the adapter. The adapter do, does that. Okay. And it doesn't potentially... Yeah. It doesn't have to be this way. It's just like, uh, uh, that's the way it was implemented in the Ponsim. So I just make it uh, kind of a copy it, but we can, we can change the time and, and make it more flexible. But but what 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 would trigger the message? For example, if something get provisioned or something um, yeah. like let's say the flow got provisioned, then the, or they associate to each other, then the message will stop. Uh, no, I, and this time it's just like it's, it's just a dumb uh, uh, PM that get collected. Uh, there's no. Oh, it's only okay. when, when a device when a device is activated, it just enable uh -huh. PM collection. It doesn't do. Oh, those are PM. Okay. Yeah, it's just PM. It doesn't okay. do anything else. Okay. 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 Yeah. So the other thing that I want to show, like uh, here, you can see that we don't have uh, any flows, and since uh, we have not uh, done the integration with OF agent, we need to because OF agent will the way it's going to talk to Volta two dot o will be different from Volta one dot x because we will have to go through the afternoon drafter and for that. So it's it's a work in progress. We have not done that. So 
So I'm going to initiate flows from the CLI because the CLI we can uh, we can just send flows uh, like EAPOL flows and all those uh, DHCP flows down. So I'm going to send some flows down. So let me send the EAPOL uh, and when I send the EAPOL flows, you can see that it's. Let me see. You can see on here. You can see on the ONU. Uh, itself, uh, it's already received the update flows. So the, basically what, what has happened by me initiating this uh, install uh, EAPOL flows, uh, we have sent that to the logical device. The logical device have initiated decomposition of that flow into flows for the OLT and ONU. Those got sent to each adapters and each adapter send that to the device. The OLT send it directly to the OLT, but the ONU send it via the Kafka bus to the OLT and the OLT send it out. So I'm going to, to just send a few of them and after, after that I'm going to show the, uh, the flows itself. I'm going to I send DHCP. I send some uh, just control bound. And I send some uh, a bunch of sample flows, which uh, cover a bunch of different uh, different scenarios. Uh, you can see here all those flows are being sent. And if you look at the I come out of here, I go to the logical. Device. If you look at flows here, those are all the bunch of flows that have sent out. Those, so those are the flows that you're seeing from the logical device perspective. And if we go to the to each devices, like uh, the OLT, let's see the flows in this one. Those are the bunch of flows that now you can see into it. And one one change that I did, like um, the flow decomposition per se, I uh, I point to whatever we had in the Volta one dot X with all the latest fixes. I think the latest one of the latest fixes I think was Chip that did that. So uh, pretty much the the flow decomposition is the most up to date. Uh, it reflects really what is in one dot X. If it's one dot five, uh, this is what's there. And plus some minor minor tweak, just really one minor tweak uh, that I did. Uh, it was uh, before uh, when we output something uh, in the flows, we were sending any flows that really need to go to the controller and the output was the NNI port. It was like, for example, this would be number two uh, that you're seeing here. Those would be, instead of saying controller, it would be number two. And then it was the adapters that was uh, changing it uh, to show that it's controller bound. So now I move that logic inside the core so that uh, for things that are really controller bound, it should show controller bound. And I'm sure there's other thing that needs to move into, into the core as well. Uh, I'll wait until the adapters start to be continuarized and then we can have a discussion of uh, how much of, of uh, other changes we need to do in, in the core for the flows. But uh, so far, it's uh, the most up to date with uh, some additional uh, uh, tweaks in it. And uh, so, what, uh, yes, so, go ahead. Um, I, I I thought you know when in the Wanda X when when the device come up, there's five flows. So how many total flows we are seeing here? Oh, here I'm, I'm basically what I what I've done. I've sent like if you look at all those commands here. I send e poll, I send the DHCP. This I'm forcing it from the CLI. It's just like uh, it's 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 flows that are from the CLI I'm I'm sending to to the logical devices. Mm -hmm. It's if we had the for example, if you have OF agent ready and was connected to mm -hmm. all nodes, then I would not have to send any of those flows. I would let the flows coming from from all nodes down. Yeah, I understand that. Since but, we don't have but right now, mm -hmm. It seems like how many, but how many information right now actually is showing what I'm saying is 
um, you know, if you do a, a flows, right? So right now, look at the table. How many total flow is displayed here? Oh, there's a lot. And this is because it's, it's from coming from those sample flows. Because uh, the sample flows is from the CLI. And mm -hmm. uh, let uh, maybe I can show you from the CLI. I, I think that's okay. I just want to, you know, because it, 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 there are some things that we have too many, you know, the flow has too many yeah. entries, sometimes get out of hand, right? So I just wonder. Is, yeah, yeah, is, this, is, is, yeah this, this is really for the demo. So it's, uh, okay. it's not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, because they, they, you can see, yeah, you can see like, oh, no problem. But, uh, but you can see like all those, those are all the flows that get sent. And those are like really, you can see this bunch of flows here. That was just, it's really for testing purposes. Okay. But it gives give us a good idea of the decomposition. And then for the ONU, want to see the flows, those are those are the flows that get sent to the ONU. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I think that's the yeah. five. Okay. Yeah. So so in terms of the demo, this is all I have for the demo itself. And uh, any questions so far? No. So in that case, I will do a code walkthrough. Uh, I've just the code walkthrough is really to highlight uh, uh, elements that uh, I think would be useful uh, for adaptive developers. So let me. Um, hey Ken. Hi Arun yes. here. Oh hi Arun. Oh uh, hey. Uh, so actually, I wanted to know so about the uh, code walkthrough that you are just doing. So will it be beneficial for? Uh, the containerization of the adapters effort oh absolutely that's okay. a, that's a and, yeah and one more thing uh, all the dockers that you have shown me shown us on the, in the in the demo so i just mm -hmm. wanted to know i mean uh, is it uh, is there any portion of that particular demo which we can use in in a final product or some other parts which we can uh, use for uh, demo of other containerized other adapters when they are containerized oh well there's part of it that you will need to, you'll be able to and there will be part that will be your own containers right uh, let me show you uh, let maybe you can maybe maybe it would be better that uh, I I go through a code walk for you ask your question during that time and uh, that maybe will clarify things a little bit better for you and if not you can ask your questions uh, additional question after how about that yeah sure okay so so this is a Volta Go repo and and that. I'm showing it from my ID. It's much easier to, 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 to see. So inside the Volta Go repo, it's all everything in Go, except there is one directory called Python. In a directory called Python, you will see everything that has to do with Python. Really, it's a Volta 1.x, uh, uh, some of the items from Volta 1.x. So what do you have? We have the adapters. We have the CLI. It's still in, uh, in Python. And anything common that it's using, uh, Docker, those are the Docker files. And uh, we have OF agent, and uh, this is a work in progress. We have some KPIs, and then we have uh, some protos. Uh, those protos are, we got them from the main protos here. So this this is the main proto, proto file. And you can see here, we don't have any of the expands. All the expands are gone here. And uh, what else you have you have the virtual environments the requirements so the, this is really a mimicking a little bit what we had in volta 1.x uh, in order to work with uh, with two dot so there's there's changes uh, i have those here because those are required changes to work with, uh, with the core so if i look into the under the adapters what you have you have anything that is common uh, like Frame.io, the KV store. This is a this is a client that we have to talk to either etcd or console, and preferably etcd. We we decided on etcd. 
So it's allowed for, for any one of them. And uh, also what you have, you have the Kafka uh, that uh, any adapters uh, will be able to use to talk to the Kafka proxy. So you have the proxy and any, any relevant uh, uh, classes there. And, in, 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 and also you have the I adapter and the interface. So this is what you have. And then you have each, you will have each adapters. For example, here I have the Ponsim OLT adapter and have the Ponsim O new adapter. And also what you have, uh, I put a readme file there that you, you could use, like uh, whatever I've did in this demo, I, you can go and, and run this in your environment. And uh, like uh, you have like how to build the containers, uh, how to set up the environment uh, in order to run the adapters, how to run the Ponsim adapter, how to provision a device. And in this case also, I put like, uh, if you want to send the uh, flows, uh, what you need to do. So it's uh, uh, this, uh, Aaron, you can use that as part of uh, a tryout and to have an idea of how, how the whole thing works. Okay, uh, just one more request. Uh, is it possible while you are going through the code, uh, if you can just demark it also uh, while going through the direct, uh, directories that this is the common part, so this will go into all the adapters and this is adapter specific thing. Yes, yeah, so that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that'll, that'll be a helpful information for containerization purpose. Okay, so, so uh, for sure. So, so basically, like anything that you see in common here. And, and the Kafka, those are really common to all adap adapters. And if there's anything that as we are progressing, we find there are something more, other things that are common, like maybe OMCI, then they can, uh, they can also move out. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, we, uh, we can all decide like how we are, because this is, all this uh, directory structure was based freely on, on, on Pansim. So when we have the other adapters in place, maybe there are things that we we'll need to add or remove uh, or move around. So we also have the I adapter. Uh, sorry, you had a question. Please continue. Okay. okay. So I adapter the the interface. Uh, what you have, you have the I adapter interface. Basically, I adapter. This is what an adapter needs to to implement. This is the interface that they need to implement. Uh, and here I put a bunch of, of uh, you have the southbound interface. This is into the core. This is what the core needs to implement. So the, the adapter will be able to call any of those methods into the core. And I think that's, that's pretty much it in terms of interfaces. And the I, I adapter has remained almost the same as uh, what it used to be. Uh, except uh, before we have the adapter agent. Now, instead of having an adapter agent, we have a core proxy. So before we were using the adap adapter ag agent to change data into the core, now we call the core proxy to do that. And the rest of it is pretty much uh, uh, the same uh, the same thing. And uh, let me go over the containerization part of it. So to containerize the Ponsim OLT and ONU, it's, it's fairly straightforward. So basically what you will need, you will have, you will need to have a main. And, uh, and, and again, this is all in Python. Like uh, if, if anyone can create an adapter in any language that they want, as long as they follow the interfaces that we that uh, we we showed here and uh, this interface as long as you follow those those interfaces you can write an adapter in any languages that you want so and and this is the case that i'm showing you it's all python so so here you build your main and uh, your main is it's pretty much similar to what you will see in the, in in the volta one dot x in the main so basically you have a bunch of uh, of argument that you want to pass in. And at this time, I've, I put a lot of arguments. I, I'm not so sure where we need all of those, but it's really dependent on on each adapters. But a lot of them will be pretty much uh, like a, just a, a copy. For example, like uh, here you can see that uh, there's a Kafka adapter and the Kafka cluster. So basically like uh, eventually what we want is any, any conversation between the adapters and the core 
goes over the Kafka adapter bus and any messaging from the adapter to the rest of the world goes on the Kafka cluster. This would be, for example, metrics, uh, alarms, and all those things will go on this on a different uh, cluster. And the Kafka adapters really, the whole goal is to talk with the core. So in the controller, so you have a bunch of arguments that you, you fill up there. So everything is like almost uh, the same. And the most important thing is pretty much uh, you set up uh, the, the the topic, your listening topic and the core, core topic. Those are the, the broadcast uh, topic for core and for the adapter. Like in, in this case, we're using the adapter name. So it will be like, in this case is Ponsim OLT. So it will be Ponsim OLT as a topic. And then we go ahead and, and start all those components. When we start the component, uh, I'm still using the registry within the, the adapters. So I register the main. I register the Kafka cluster proxy. So it's, I, I create the, the proxy. I create uh, a core proxy. A core proxy, this is talk to the core. I create an adapter proxy. This is adapted adapter proxies to talk to another adapter via the Kafka, Kafka bus, bus. And then I create the, the adapter. Like in this case, it's a Ponsim OLT adapter. I create that adapter. I create an adapter facade with that uh, with the adapter that I just created. So what is the adapter facade? If we look at this, basically what it is, this is the, the call that uh, when, it, when a request comes in over Kafka and the Kafka proxy will receive that request, it will call this adapter request facade. And, and, and uh, this is where you register it when you create the Kafka messaging proxy. You put a target class, and this is the Ponsim request handler, which is this facet. Basically, a request comes in from the proxy, it invoke this target class. And this target class, for example, let's take an, an example of, uh, for example, when we enable the device, what it ends up with the request coming from the core is an adopt device. So the, the proxy sends an adopt device and to the adapter. So the adapter, first thing that it does, because those uh, data are, follows a certain uh, protocol of the are in binaries, so we decode them. We have to decode them and pack them. And once we unpack them, we call the actual device, the, the adopt device. In this case, uh, the adopt device is done in the adapter, the I adapter, I adapter does that. Uh, look up for the device and then create the actual handler that does the, the activation. And in this case, that will be the Ponsim OLT. One thing of note, uh, you'll see that uh, once a adopt device is received, the first thing that it does, it's invoke the activation, it's its own uh, reactive thread. The reason why we want it that way is so that when any request being sent over the Kafka, we want to have an acknowledgement right away. We don't want the request to be complete, go to completion and then get a response back. We want to make sure when we send something out that the other end have received the request. So by doing, by calling this, uh, calling the reactor call later, what we are doing is we're put, pushing it in a different thread and we're returning the device. So right away, this is, we're sending an act back to the caller and then we're processing with the request. So this is, this is the common pattern. The same thing will happen when the adapters send a message into the core. If the adapter is expecting some messages right away, if the message is to be sent right away, the core will send it right away. Otherwise, we'll, the core will just send an act and then process the message after. So let me see where we were we main. So we, we have this. And then Ein we Teilnehmer just... hat das Gespräch vorübergehend verlassen. Uh, sorry. Okay, I guess it was a different call. So once all this is done, then you register with call. 
and register with core pretty much uh, what it means is uh, you send in the adapter descriptor and their devices that it supports. And that's pretty much it in terms of registration that it does. Once that is done, you're good to go. So it's uh, there's not much, as you can see, there's not much uh, to continuize there. It's once you have the main there, and this will be a pattern I'm pretty sure uh, most adapters uh, can follow. Once you have that, the bulk of the of the work is really done in the adapter per se. In the like in this case, what we have, we have the Ponsim OLT handler, and it's the same thing that we had before. So before, like if if I open the before when we had the Ponsim OLT as an adapter, when everything was in core, you had this in core. Yeah. So this is this code is still there. There's, there's not a lot of differences uh, to it. The only thing of note, a few things of note, is first, there's not uh, ex, there's no more expand. So all those expand uh, related stuff are gone. And also, if you take the case of an activate device, like let me go through the activate the way it was before and, and now, because this is this is the main as the main difference here. So this is the older code. When you were doing activate before, uh, there was a bunch of action that you were doing, like you were changing the device, uh, updating the device, creating the peer metrics. Uh, all those actions you still need to do them, like creating your port, that's okay. But one thing that uh, the adapter was doing was creating the logical device. And also it was creating the logical port. And then we're sending that into the call. Now, if you look at uh, the activate, we do a bunch of things like uh, changes into changing the device. And now we, we call the proxy to update the device. And remember, we always need to do a yield here because uh, this is go going outside the core. So it's better to outside the, the container. It's better to do to yield for, for that action. We do everything. The same, we're creating those uh, in the night port, the internal port. We're, we're calling the core, we're telling the core that, yeah, we have created this in the night port, we have created this uh, UNI port uh, uh, on device, and then we change the device state. So just by doing this, the core will be triggered, but after we change the state to create the logical device and the NNI, the logical ports on that device. And uh, here in the, this is similar to the old code in the sense of uh, at the end of the activation, we says, oh, we discovered a bunch of child devices. We, we send it to the core, which is child device detected. And we are sending that uh, message back. And then that will get the core to activate all those old news. As part of the creation of the logical device, the core needs to have more information on the on the each device that uh, that we are being activating, for example, for an OLT, it needs to know the switch capability of it. So there's a special message that comes back where the core asks for that. And and this this is really like uh, the way I make it. It's um, very close to what the policy requires. But uh, if there is a request for other adapters, we need to augment this. Then uh, then we need to do so. So it's, uh, it's, uh, this is, all this is really based on, on, on the limited use case of Ponsim. And also when we create the, when we create the, the, the port in the, inside the core, we need to have some more information about the, that port, for example, the current speed, max speed. So those are information that only the adapters knows. So we invoke this method uh, on that UNI port. And, and note here, we don't use the before the adapter was determining the the logical device the logical port id uh, it no longer determines that we still use the vlan id uh, but uh, we can have a map a different mapping uh, but i would want to wait until we have other adapters uh, start to use it and then the, 
then we can adjust accordingly. And the other thing of note um, in the adapters, uh, you'll see a send proxy message. Uh, I, I should have removed that, it, uh, it's, it's no longer used. Basically what we have now, we have a inter-adapter message. Inter-adapter message is, is any message from one adapter to another adapters. It can be a proxy message, could be a message just dedicated to a device or dedicated to the adapter. So it's, it's just the whole point is make it as generic as possible. So in this case, uh, there's two different types of requests that it uh, received for this OLT. We are getting flow requests and matrix requests. So pr pretty much uh, we're sending those uh, to the own use, like a flow request that will go to the own use and metrics request also that goes to the own use. Other than that, like uh, for the own use uh, containerization, it's pretty much, it's the same thing. Like uh, you'll see like it's, uh, you have, the pattern is exactly the same. There's nothing very different from there. And uh, what else? And uh, also everything has, like for activation, it's the same thing. So nothing has really, uh, from the OLT and ONU adapters, it's the same pattern. There's not a, a lot of difference in that. And uh, here's a case, here's a scenario when it, for example, when we are updating the flow table on an ONU uh, adapter, the ONU send, use the inter-adapter message to send the flow to the OLT, eventually that goes to the device. So to do that, it, 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 it uses this uh, method and it waits uh, for the results. And, and one thing just to, have, just to, as a reminder, the yield, the first yield here, the first request of into adapter message, we're sending that and the first one, we get an acknowledgement back that the adapter has received it. So the first yield, wait for the acknowledgement, and then we wait for the result. And when we wait for the result, we yield for it, and then we'll get a, for example, in this case, the flow response, okay? And uh, that's pretty much it uh, in terms of, uh, of points that I want to, wanted to highlight uh, for containerization adapters. Uh, any questions? Okay, so, um... Can in a nutshell, so if we take an example of uh, containerizing the open OLT adapter, so mm -hmm. I think the 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 few activities that we need to do is uh, basically, uh, uh, I mean, to create a skeleton adapter or a skeleton code, uh, mm -hmm. we move the we move move the open OLT code here un under the adapters uh, directory, and mm -hmm. the common common Kafka uh, because they are common to all the adapters will be. Uh, there in the Docker for that, and mm -hmm. along with along with that, uh, OpenOLT will have its own Python code with, in which it will implement its own uh, callbacks, which need to be called from. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, so uh, we'll have a directory here for OpenOLT. Right, like uh, like the like one file we had is OpenSimOLT. dot mm -hmm. py. We will have a similar kind of thing like OpenOLT dot py or something like that and exactly. uh, then we, i think we also need to update the interface dot py for uh, updating the uh, adapter into the core uh, this file yeah no this file is common to all of them okay uh, so any changes required in interface dot py or i adapter dot py i uh, know uh, unless uh, unless there's some for example if there's a a specific command that you need, need a specific request that is not there, then we need to add it. Okay. And uh, one more thing. So whatever the callbacks which are mentioned in the file, uh, okay. are they the standard interfaces or uh, they have different signatures in different uh, adapters? Let's turn down the callbacks. Uh, give me an example. I mean, uh, so, if we call update flow table, so uh, mm -hmm. so the same name will be used for every adapter, or is it? Yes. Is it? Yes. Okay. Yes, because so this, this is this is, how, this this is, is standard how, interface. Yeah, you see, like this is uh, just update flow table bugs. Those like uh, uh, let, let me backtrack a little bit. Okay. Uh, 
the update like in this case the update flow table this is from the Ponsim ONU, but the Ponsim ONU uh, get everything from the I adapter. The okay. I adapter implements the update flow bugs because we have the I adapter interface in between, like everybody is using. So the I adapter, the, what it needs to implement is the update flow bug, and this is what is in the interface. Now, what goes inside it? For example, it's invoke uh, the Ponsim ONU new adapter. It's going to use the update flow table inside the ONU itself. That's that's more internal, but the one that uh, needs to abide to the adapter needs to abide to is the update flows per update flows incrementally. This is if you look at this at the top, the I adapter implements the I adapter interface, and the I adapter interface. Is is this is this guy? You got it. I yeah, I got it. Okay. So as long as those are implemented by the I adapter and the the method that you use internally, that's that's up to you. But this is very common. Like uh, this is, I've seen it across all adapters. So they use of, like those kind of name, like update for tables, stuff like that. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, if if there is a standard practice, then it should be actually followed into all the adapters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any okay. other thank you. No, uh, thank how, you. Can, how can this submit? So, I have a question on the, what you just said regarding the yield uh, when you call the send inter adapter message. Mm -hmm. So, um, you said that um, it will yield till it hears back from the adapter to which the message was sent, right? Yeah, it so will yield until it gets an acknowledgement back. Yeah, so just wanted to understand that a little better. Uh, so because we are using Kafka, so is it that the recipient adapter is sending back a message on the Kafka bus? Yes. And so how do you correlate the request and the response? Okay, so so let me, there's different ways to do it, but I'll, I'll show you an example of how I did it uh, for, for, for this scenario. So basically before I send a request, I created transaction ID. So this oh, okay. ID here, and yeah. uh, I have an uh, internal that's map. <laughs> so that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, yeah, I use this. Uh, it's an internal map with that transaction ID, and I create a deferred for that. And here I wait for that deferred. Uh, so yeah. when the message comes in, uh, if you look at the process inter, inter adapter message, it called the receive message, like, uh, and the receive message what it does. It look at the transaction ID. It's invoke callback on that. That's how the the callback is invoked. Okay. Answer the question. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, again, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. What about the, what about other other the contents of other directories which are there in inside Python directory other than the adapters directory? So, do we mm -hmm. also need to move move something into the containers from them? Oh, no, 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 no. It's uh, like basically what you're going to have under the adapters here. Uh, here you have Ponsim OLT, Ponsim ONU. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll have a, an open OLT uh, right. a directory. And within that, you'll have a, chances you'll have a main and any other uh, aspect of open OLT that is very specific for open OLT that you're going to put there. Uh, okay. If there is some something that is generic that can be shared across adapters, then if you can't put it under Kafka or Common, then you can create another directory uh, for something that is very specific that everybody will use. Just create another directory so that you can Got share it. it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And, and, and while we're doing, uh, moving the code uh, uh, left, right, and center, I, I remember we moved the Pond Resource Manager at the same time, like just just, just to make it consistent of what what's there in the in the Volta 1.x, uh, I've noticed that uh, in 1.x we're using the console or etcd store, and we're using the config backend from the Volta core. So that that's all right in the 1.x release, but in 2.0, uh, the adapter will not have any access to this data. This data is it's, it's not there. You can't have access to the internal Volta data. 
So in order to talk to the to the Kiwi store, you have to use the the Kiwi client here. There's there's a, a client that is common for everybody to use. There's a lot of all kind of methods set up there. So use that instead of uh, of of those methods if the moment that you're going to use uh, continuation. But in uh, in one dot x is it's all right. Okay. Uh, so uh, we had an earlier discussion about this one with Shad. Uh, I think you were not there in the last call. So the question was how we manage the uh, container respawning if the if the container actually goes bad, and the state how we will manage the state of the uh, devices. So uh, so the final outcome was that we we will store all the states and all the uh, device specific data inside the KV store, and when the Docker is coming up instantiating to pull all the states from the KV store. So I'm just wondering, uh, that thing is still available in this code and uh, uh, we can we can use it in that way. Okay, but uh, but why you want to, are those states are uh, very like, um, very specific, like are those, can those states be stored in a core instead of uh, the adapters? I mean, I'm talking from a very high level. I'm not exactly sure oh. of what the states are, but uh, the the discussion was around uh, around around the auto healing part. If the if any of the Docker goes bad and it is it is actually maintaining a current uh, an active device and we need to respawn the container, then how we will make sure that the whatever the device it is maintaining continues to be maintained properly. So oh. for that, whatever the information which is re required need to be stored inside the KV store and then the adapter will pull the information from there. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Okay, uh, any other questions? Um, nothing, Greg, I uh, Hello? I mean, just wanted to know, I mean, uh, for this particular use case, we have the interfaces available in the KV client right now, or we need to uh, create some some code. No, no, it's uh, all the interfaces to interact with the KV client uh, is there. So the, this is the KV client. So you can use uh, any of those. Uh, like for example, you can use Watch. You can do do any of those things. So it's, I, I recommend to use the KV client because the KV client is an abstraction. Uh, it doesn't say whether it's an etcd client or a console client just use the kv client it's more a, a shim layer so that later yeah, on yeah. if you want to replace we just uh, replace uh, the client if you want to okay so it's uh, i haven't uh, seen uh, about, is there any data structure specific or it is just like a free flowing text with a value the key and value thing the key, well, a value, you can put whatever value you want, right? A key typically is a string. Okay, key is a string, okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Any, any other questions? Uh, Ken, on the general repository, is that a public repository yet, or is it private? No, no, it's public. This is, uh, okay. this Voltago is uh, it's public. It's under, uh, if you go under Gary, and uh, oh, you okay. see the project uh, Volta Go, uh, you'll oh. see that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, we, to... we also post the link to the to the, the that's the same link we we, we post we posted on the wiki front page, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And I think Craig has a question, right? Yeah, you earlier, Ken, had uh, talked about uh, creating ports and logical ports from the adapter. Um, and I thought I heard you mention that the logical port ID was assigned by the core. It seems to be different than from 1.x. Could you elaborate on that again about uh, who is responsible for creating the logical port IDs? Uh, the logical port ID is created by the core. Uh, however, at this time, we're following the same pattern that we did in 1.x in the sense of uh, in 1.x the adapter was setting the logical port id was creating the logical port id and setting the id uh, to be the villain id so in the in the core at this time we are creating the the logical device id logical port and the id as well but 
like we're also using the VLAN ID at, at the same time. If we want to change that to have a different ID, then we can do so in the core as well. We just need to have a mapping between uh, the VLAN ID and the actual ID of the logical port. Yeah, I probably want to talk to you about that offline a little bit. Um, the, the open OLT adapter kind of depends on a specific encoding of the logical port number. So uh, yeah, we need to make sure we can coordinate on that. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, like I said, like uh, the, most of what I did here was based on the PONSIM OLTs and when used. So once there's other adapters in place, when, once we have more use cases, then we can definitely have a a better way of uh, of handling this. At least enough use cases uh, to handle uh, to handle it. Yeah, because Open OLT does some things a little differently than PONSIM. So mm -hmm. we... exactly, yeah, for sure. It's PONSIM is just a simulated <laughs> uh, OLT, and when you. Any other questions? Okay, okay so Ken, guess, thank you. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we can move on to our next topic. So Ken and Sergio, I think the add to the agenda for, um, for the Affinity Router, that we'll need to hold to the end to make sure we have time because we've got Craig's topic to go over next. So if we need okay. to schedule the Affinity Router for a different time, we can add that in Tuesday if that works for you guys. But we'll see how things go for the next discussion. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to have to rush. So if we've yeah. got ten minutes left, I, I'm not going to try and rush through it. So we'll got just it. Okay. move it to Tuesday. If, uh, if, okay. If there's, if there's twenty minutes left, we're good. If there's less than that, I think. We'll move it to Tuesday. I think we'll probably need to move it to Tuesday. So let me okay. go ahead. Uh, Craig, are you ready for me to give you presentation rights? Sure. Okay. All right, you should have them in a moment. Can you see? Yes. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I uh, have been uh, assigned to, to look at adding support for multiple unis on a single OMU. And the uh, community asked to put together a little bit of analysis of, um, of what would go into that. Um, for the most part, this has kind of been a hunt and destroy type of mission. Um, it, it kind of littered around lots of different places in the system. Uh, so I kind of um, I'm going to go through uh, some of the bullet items that uh, that we found and. Um, again, if there are probably some areas of uh, concern that have been missed, and definitely welcome the uh, feedback from from uh, the subject matter experts in the different areas. Um, a little bit of this would be covering existing designs. Uh, there's high, high amounts of correlation with uh, what's being worked on with the tech profiles. Uh, kind of describe a little bit about what's going on there. Uh, but for the most part, the, the issues at hand have to do with um, the identification and addressing of the unis. Uh, a lot of the system seems to have addressed unis by ONUs and ONUs as unis kind of interchangeably. So there's uh, quite a bit of work to kind of litter around to kind of separate that identification. Um, the other part is the, the actual incarnation of the flows on the devices and uh, I'll cover, cover that as far as the, the connectivity models. So starting from the bottom uh, uh, bottom up in the MIB discovery of unis, uh, this, this already already exists in the MIB upload that uh, is implemented in 1.x. Uh, we will retrieve from the ONU a complete list of unis and PPTPs for, for that ONU. Um, the important part to, uh, that I wanted to highlight is that the MEIDs in that discovery for the unis actually do identify the port IDs uh, uniquely. Uh, and for ONUs that have multiple slots in them, uh, the, the slot ID is part of that MEID, MEID. So if you want to think about the MEIDs as being the, the, lot, the, the device 
specific port IDs, um, and and then we what we'll do is we'll just iterate through those to create the unis. Uh, so no changes necessary for the MIB upload for the discovery of the own, of the unis. But when we have identified the unis from the MIB upload, um, we're going to create a relative port number for the for that particular ONU, 1234, et cetera, for the unis uh, that is derived from that MEID that I just described. So uh, essentially, uh, do the artifact of how the MEIDs are encoded, just sort them numerically, and then uh, number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, to get the, um, what uh, in, in, inside of the code currently is called the MAC bridge port number. And those port numbers will then also be uh, rep the logical port names. Sorry, uh, so uh, yeah, that's for the ONU relative port numbers. On the device port numbers, the, the, the port number that's represented uh, in, in Volta, uh, we will continue to use the, the ID of a uni dash uh, port number, but uh, that port number is an encoding. And currently there's a bit encoding that's being used that is 16 bits. Um, it is a little bit limited in scope for some ONUs that we've seen on the market. So I'm proposing to expand the or change the bit encoding to be a um, an 18 bit encoding to allow 32 pawns per OLT, 128 unis or ONUs per pawn, and up to 64 unis per ONU. Currently, the encoding only allows 16 pawns and four unis per ONU. So again, this uh, this encoding of the device port number actually bleeds over into what becomes the logical port number, and that's why I was asking Ken uh, that previous question about logical port numbers. Uh, so that port number would ultimately be represented in the OpenFlow controller uh, as the port number for the uni. So uh, the OpenOLT uses this six mapping to be really to be able to identify the, the device and the MEs coming back downstream when, when we get a flow coming back from the, the controller. The port name that, uh, we're, that we're gonna propose that's represented in the open flow controller as a logical port name, uh, presently it is only the serial number of the ONU. And of course, if there's more than one port on the ONU, we have to uniquely identify those from a name perspective, and uh, the proposal on the, here is that we'll just uh, attack on a suffix of a dash X to the serial number to represent the, the device specific port number that was calculated earlier. Uh, Craig, In the case of, yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I've heard discussions of 48 port OLTs, so just a, consideration for that for the five bit pawn ID, you may want to reconsider that. I'm not third thirty two yep, seems like I can definitely increase that to six bits. I mean it seems it uh, doesn't seem as realistic, but you know, I have heard discussions of those type designs. So for G Pawn. Great. Thanks for the feedback. I, I can include that. As long as nobody in the community has concerns about uh, going I, over sixteen and, bits of what the current encoding is. Yeah, I can confirm that there's a cheap on OLT uh, in more than just planning, uh, which is expected to be come out in a couple of months, which is 64 on points. And I would consider everything that is uh, not at least four times as large as uh, right now uh, available as somewhat limited for a future proof solution. But just my opinion, sorry. So are you suggesting that 64 is too small? or 64 adequate? Uh, anybody that would uh, invent the idea to uh, include uh, existing uh, shelf-based OLTs into a Volta solution, which have already have uh, 256 ports, would already uh, immediately create problems. I don't have an issue of increasing the, 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 the bit width of, of the font ID to you 
Yeah, for future proofing, it's probably a good consideration. Why are you limiting to 18 bits or 19 or whatever that is? Why not just make nope. it a 32-bit number? No particular reason. The, the, the actually, uh, the upper two bits have been reserved for NNI uh, identification uh, okay. and, and internal PON identification. But uh, so we won't be able to get all 32 bits, but I think we can do 29 or 30 bits. Okay, I, uh, I would probably just take advantage of the full size. Fair enough. Okay, um, one last comment on the port name convention. If there is a ONU that only has a single uni for backwards compatibility, I propose that we would not append the suffix of a dash one. It would just be the serial number that everybody's been familiar with to date. So uh, during port, dis uh, port discovery, um, you know, we do the MIB upload. After the MIB upload is completed, the OMCI uh, will declare a MIB sync. At that point in time, uh, the current code goes through and creates the uni ports and adds them as logical ports. Uh, that process will still be the same, with the exception that we will now iterate through all the discovered unis rather than uh, just creating a single so no logical change there, just a quantity change. One thing that will be different, um, though, is after the initial uh, sync is completed, when we create those logical ports, we will not be providing any default uh, flows on uh, no initial mid download for flows and bridge elements to the ONU. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what that default flow looks like in the magic VLAN 4091. Etc. At this point, during the, the the startup, all that we will do is control the, the uni state, and we will defer uh, flow creation until the ONOS sends us the initial flows based upon the configuration. With regard to flows, uh, the flows are. Um, Kind of a little bit of ambiguity today. The flows are kind of being addressed to ONUs. Um, what we will be addressing the flows at the individual uni level, so you know, they are coming in for a logical port. Um, so there are two different ports on the same ONU. They'd be treated as two different flows uh, with two different logical ports coming into Volta. Uh, Again, ONOS will be responsible for creating the initial flow once the, the logical port is added to the controller. Uh, there will, will not be any default initial flows that are created uh, in the adapters. So um, one of the things that uh, the, the tech profile work has been working on is uh, when the flows come in from the, the adapter or from the controller, the, uh, the tech profile is processed based upon the table ID of the flows that are included. And um, that's the, the information that's processed is used to calculate the number of gem ports, t cons, um, and internal flow IDs that are being allocated for that particular flow. And that information is stored in the tech profile instance. That's kind of outside the scope of the work that we're doing here for multiple unis, but that's kind of what it's doing today. The problem with uh, the current implementation is that it is storing the, the results based upon an ONU ID. Um, so we're going to propose making this minor change that the tech profile instance is actually storing uh, to the full uni name with the dash port number suffix so that we can have the gem ports allocated for each individual uni separately stored as different tech profiles in the KD store. Uh, things that are put in there, of course, like I said, are the TCON details, the gem port information, uh, and bandwidth profiles and so forth. So no, no real change there from what the tech profile work is being done, other than the fact that we are dependent on that tech profile work being completed. Once the tech profile is stored into the, the instance is stored into the KV store, uh, the ONU adapter is alerted to that. Uh, there's been a lot of heavy discussion about how it gets alerted. Uh, 
I'm going to defer that discussion to the tech profile work, but assume that the ONU is, uh, adapter is notified that there is uh, a tech profile instance in the KV store. Uh, at this point in time, there will be a set of tasks queued up in the ONU adapter to download the, the gem ports and the connectivity to the, uh, to the ONU a flow specific download task that's replacing the default nib download that was previously in the ONU adapter. On a little bit different fronts, uh, so when the tech profile is being processed to allocate gem IDs and TCON alloc IDs, um, that work is using the resource manager and the resource manager has uh, uses the KD store for storing the allocations of what's been allocated. Again, presently, that is being stored uh, only to the device level, or excuse me, to the ONU level. And here's a, a the minor change here is changing that to be stored uh, out all the way to the UNI level. So we can map, keep a mapping of which IDs are allocated to which UNIs, as opposed to what's today being done is it's mapping which IDs to have been allocated to which ONUs. And from Kim's earlier discussion, it looks like we need to uh, change the resource manager and how it accesses the KD store, but uh, uh, a little bit outside the scope of this discussion. Similar uh, concepts that you know, I just mentioned on the previous slide that we're storing the, the, the the instance information in the KD store addressed all the way to the particular uni rather than the ONU. So during the mid download for the flow specific information, we will use that the, the gem ports and alloc IDs that have been allocated and we will uh, create any instances based upon uh, a number of different options available to us. What we're going to do initially is to use the L2 OCM model in the OMCI spec, which uh, I think I had a, a picture of that on the next slide, but there are other options out there for the connectivity models. That's, uh, you know, M for NP or uh, one for a P or different connectivity models that are defined. The understanding is that we would ultimately be providing the connectivity models and attribute in the tech profile for selecting which one is available. Uh, what we're going to propose is to use the L2 OCM, which um, essentially each uni has a different bridge, uh, bridge pattern associated with it. I'll show that in a, a few more slides. For the, the initial flow, the, uh, the EFL flow that is uh, currently being pushed during uh, when we first come up, we create a, a set of gem ports in MIB download, and then the ONOS controller sends the EPOL flow. Uh, we will, as I mentioned before, defer the creation of that flow until we get the, uh, defer creation of the gem ports in the MAC bridge until we get the, the flow from the ONOS controller. Uh, that default flow, as it exists today from the controller, does not include any CTAG information just says to send to the controller of the EPOL uh, based upon ether type matching. We'll continue to do that and we will, uh, on the open OLT side, create a trap uh, in the hardware that's based on ether type and the gem port only. There will be no uh, VLAN ID classification, so we will no longer have a dependency on the magical 4091 VLAN that uh, is set up initially in the current code. The ONUs will be configured to forward the EPOLs uh, uh, in initial flows with no tagging operation, just sending up the EPOL on tag. And then after the, the, the port is authenticated and we get a, a subscriber access configuration from ONUS that will have a C tag and S tag information in it, then of course we will set up flows with VLAN tagging operations, the tag, C tag, and the ONU, and the VAL will, uh, in the OLT side, will continue to trap the e-poles uh, 
with or without the, the VLAN tag. Uh, so there is no change in the, the flow for the ePoll. It's still the same original flow for trapping. So summary here is we're using the, the flows that are coming from ONOS to can configure uh, the, both the default flows as well as the, the regular data flows. The connectivity model that I mentioned earlier um, on the right side, this is uh, you know, excerpt from the OMCI spec. It's an eye chart, but you, basically the, the, the essence of it is, is for each uni, uni here and a uni here, each uni has a separate MAC bridge, MAC bridge here, MAC bridge here, which is mapped to their own set of gem ports. So you, uni one has these four gem ports, uni two has these four gem ports that are then uh, connected up to the TCONs independently. So each, there will be no shared MAC bridge within the ONU in this model. Each uni uh, cannot communicate with the other uni without going up through uh, the gem ports and all the way up to the, the OLT. So that's an, an important classification because there are models of connectivity in which there's a single bridge instance and the unis are, are all connected to that bridge but they may share they all share a single set of gem ports on the upstream side we felt that that this model was easier to uh, capture at the moment because each uni is being managed separately from the onus controller with different sets of flows uh, we we'll continue to maintain that as separation of logical ports A quick question, Craig, if you can back up. This may just be my ignorance, but on the model you're using, why are you using separate um, northbound bridge ports to separate gym ports out? So you have two gym ports on one um, bridge port and two others on a different bridge port instead of having them all with one P-bit mapper. Uh, one right here and right here. Yeah, exactly. You have two bridge ports and two gyms uh, on each one. I, this diagram is actually lifted from the ITU spec. Um, they're trying to show that more of an abstract representation. Okay. So um, we can have different, thing. different, two different VLANs coming out yep. here. Yep. The intent of what we'll implement is there will be there'll be one MAC bridge port, one mapper, to say for for gem ports. Yep. Okay. That'll okay. all be that'll all be really controlled from the tech profile as to the number of ports and a uh, number of gem ports and the mapping. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. The important part of what we're gonna do is we'll just replicate that per uni, but uh, you know, the, the actual mapping of number of, uh, of bridge ports is the work of what the tech profile is doing. Okay, cool. Uh, on another front, uh, handling Packet in, controller bound packets are being trapped. Um, the current implementation of the OpenOLT uses a KV store lookup to map, uh, essentially, a, a mapping that identifies the gem port back to a logical port ID. Every packet that is trapped through the OpenOLT controller does a lookup in the KV store. Um, that, that, that has big impacts to the overall performance of uh, if we start having a, a large number of packets that are being trapped and or the, the, the response times of those packets. Um, so as part of this effort, because of the, of the fact that we all already had to make a change from ONU identification to UNI identification of the jump ports, uh, the proposal here is to actually get rid of that KV store for that particular mapping and defer or delegate that responsibility to the OLT driver itself. Uh, so when the, the flows are created from the adapter down to the device, we'll actually include the port number with that flow. This is the logical port number. And then when the packets are trapped and sent back to the controller, we will send back to the, uh, the adapter that logical port number that was re represented for that flow for that, for that um, controller bound trap. And that way 
the adapter doesn't have to do a lookup in the KD store to find the logical port number again. That's basically a interface change between OLT adapter and OLT driver. Back at the ONA side and the uh, uh, configuration of, uh, of services in SATIS, uh, currently SATIS has a lookup key that's based upon the serial number of, of the uni. Uh, but the, the uni is identified as a serial number of the ONU, so kind of as a mixture of being ONU specific versus uni specific. Um, what we're going to propose is to continue to be able to support that from a status perspective that uh, the, the subscriber record could still be a single serial number record to reflect all the unis that are on that ONU. But in addition to that, a you know, simple extension that the, the, the status record could be a complete uni identification, which is serial number dash port number. Um, so what we're proposing is that in the ONS application, the OLT application and the AAA application, that when we go to look up the status record, we'll first look up uh, by the specific uni with the dash port number extension. If the record doesn't exist, we'll fall back to looking up just on the serial number to find the, you know, the, the record that may already exist. Thought process here is that that would fit in with the current workflows that are be being used that are configuring the status records as at the ONU level rather than at the uni level. Uh, open for discussion if, if that seems necessary or not, but uh, that was the proposal on the table. Oh, hi, this is Amit. Uh, so uh, as far as I understand, uh, SADIS looks up uh, based on the logical port name. And uh, yes. because uh, as, you, as you already mentioned that you're going to be changing the logical port name to have the hyphen uh, the MacBridge port number, right? So if that is provisioned the same way in the SADIS database, so that should work transparently. Correct. It, so if we use the complete name, there's no change at all. The proposal yeah. is to continue to support North Bend interfaces, which may be pushing SADIS records that only have serial number. I don't know if that's a requirement or not, uh, but if, it, it, you know, if you know, the current SELA implementation is configuring a ONU by serial number, not by a uni by a port number. Uh, that, so the, the idea here is we'd first look up on the complete name. If the complete name didn't match, then we would, we would uh, divide up that name to the serial number only, look it up again. If there's no okay. concern over uh, supporting the existing configuration of you know, serial number only, then we can remove that requirement and that implementation. Yeah, uh, we, we could check with uh, the way it is getting used. Um, most probably uh, it should not, uh, it should not, uh, it should not need a change is what my understanding is. Yeah, I'll, I'll open up some discussions about that, you know, because it's kind of pushing even northbound of the the controller of who's pushing the status records in, right? Uh, on the OLT side itself, on the device, um, some internal details. Each flow that's going to different unis will have a different set of uh, queues and schedulers within the OLT in, in the devices. They will all have different key cons and DBA schedulers to the upstream. Uh, so we won't be sharing any of the, uh, the, the traffic management characteristics between unis. So two unis on one ONU versus two unis on two separate ONUs would be really treated the same with regard to how we set up the OLT and the queue management and the traffic management. Also took an option to kind of lay this all out in, in some sequence diagrams. Took some liberty at some short uh, synopsis, so if I missed some detailed steps, I apologize. Uh, capturing it from the beginning through uh, the initial authentication, 
bottom up discovery from an ONU happening today. Uh, no change in implementation for this story. Uh, ONU is discovered by the OLT. OLT sends the discovery to the adapter. We go through the process of adding the ONU and activating the ONU adapter. Um, ultimately, once the ONU is completely authentic or uh, activated, and we get the ONU ad OLT adapter, we'll add the device to the core. That will create and uh, adopt the ONU adapter device, which triggers the NIB upload via proxy through the OLT uh, to, to load up on the NIB from the ONU. Once we're done with the NIB upload and the OMCI stack declares it's in sync, at this point we will be creating the logical ports for each uni. Each port will be added to core. Um, look, looks like we have a new way of doing that in, in Ken's demo. But uh, each of those ports will be added to the open controller. <coughs> the status record may or may not exist at this point in time. Uh, you know, there were some discussions that uh, we don't know the ordering. This may be fully pre-provisioned and discovered before the records show up. But what, either way, uh, it really doesn't matter at this point because the, uh, the OLT app today creates an EPOL flow that does not have any information about the subscriber record itself, doesn't have the C tag or S tag information in it. Multi core will decompose that in the flow decomposer, sending a flow update to the OLT adapter and a flow update to the ONU adapter. I believe, if my understanding is correct, that we cannot depend on the ordering of these. Uh, one, they have to be handled order independently. On the OLT adapter side, go through the resource manager, process the tech profile, allocate gen port IDs, alloc IDs, flow IDs. <coughs> And we will then store those in the KB store for a tech profile instance, some mechanism. Again, some debate about what this mechanism is, whether it's inner adapter messaging or KB watch here. Uh, but the ONU adapter is notified that the tech profile instance is available. In conjunction with the flow information that's coming from the flow decomposer, we'll start an ONCI download tasks for the tech profile specifics to create the gem ports and alloc IDs that TCONs in the ONU or the L2 OCM connectivity. At this point, uh, this initial flow should just be the ePoll, uh, <coughs> an end device, an RG, whatever uh, would send us ePolls will be untagged as it shows up at the OLT, and we'll generate a packet indication, uh, the packet indication up to the OLT adapter, packet in all the way to the controller. Highlighting, you know, kind of masking a bunch of stuff that's happening, but you get the heap transaction from the radius server all the way to the supplicant. At some point in time, we do get an access accept from the radius server, and that will the authentication sequence. Nothing happens uh, presently unless you have an integration with SIBA, which SIBA would be listening to this access except for the authentication completion and would use the, uh, would add a, the Volta uh, subscriber uh, service. Looks up out of the status database to provide the, the, the data flows for the C tag and S tag to the core. Same sequence that we saw before, but now we will have C tag information flowing all the way down into the the tasks that are being downloaded into the uh, ONU. And I believe that's all that I have for today. If there's uh, any thoughts or discussions or concerns. Oh, oh, oh. 
Yeah, I think we are getting, you know, uh, exceeding the time duration. But, uh, you know, Craig, thanks for putting this together. I think that's combined with the de com flow decomposer discussion we have last week, right? So um, I think I would definitely would like the community to take a look at this and then providing the feedback. One thing I, I you know, with the new, a, a, a quick question, um, with the, with the proposal on the the uni you know all those uh, in your earlier slide pages um does it mean um then that will be Im impacting the existing implementation is that correct uh, the, the intent is that if we provision a single you if, if the all new discovers a single uni that there would be no real change uh everything okay. would be represented the same as what it had previously done. I'm actually thinking that we would extend uh, the resource manager profile, which has the ranges for gym ports and ALEC IDs, to also include the maximum number of unis. So we could use the tech profile to limit it to a single uni, and in which case all the existing implementation would be unchanged through, through a profile uh, for the resource manager. Okay, but the, but the, the flow the flow we represented here doesn't matter what single uni or multi uni, right? Correct. Today we don't connect up the second through nth uni anyway. Okay, Julie, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I really, you know, thanks Craig and Ken for the for the presentation today. I think today's meeting it has a lot of information in there. Um, so I uh, really would like to people take a look of these proposals. Um, some I think uh, some service provider are you know multi uni uh, ONU is required. So 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 I think we definitely need to take a good look of these. Um, but uh, I think if that people I encourage people to ask questions on the on the vote to discuss and I don't know what our room is still on and then you 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 I used also wanting to have a separate call to discuss the OLT, open OT containerization containerization I believe a room dropped okay then then okay I think these are uh, important issues we need to address. But so, Julie, back to you. Yes, Sean, I will arrange another meeting for the open OLT containerization. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, I'll go ahead and take presentation rights back really quickly for the wrap up here. Well, I will try to give me one second. Thanks, Ken and Craig. That was really good information today. Yeah, thank you to everyone. Good discussion. And so I think Tuesday, since we do have uh, an additional topic to go over, which is the affinity router, Sergio was going to review that. Uh, Sergio, I think, said Tuesday worked for him. I, what I'd like to do is allocate about half of Tuesday's meeting to this, which means we'll need to kind of try and take care of as many updates for status updates for the sprint uh, offline before the call, or uh, we'll go over new issues during the call. But I think we'll try and do status updates uh, in a offline fashion as much as possible so we can devote time on Tuesday's meeting, because I think it's important to get that in early for the discussion. Uh, any questions from the group? before we wrap today. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll go ahead and stop the recording and close the bridge. Appreciate everyone's participation.